a lot of people online. Uh, again, thanks to those of you who traveled far uh, to, to be here with us today. So this is the second panel discussion on socioeconomic rights. Um, that is Justice Mojiti is facilitating. Uh, yes, after the Dean's Distinguished Lecture, which we had last year, and uh, in which uh, Justice Nazib indicated that, that he really facilitated these discussions this year. Uh, and, and this one is, of course, with uh, Justice Yolfu, the Justice of the Constitutional Court, and Ms. Munzah, who is on the Executive Director of uh, the Social Economic Rights Institute uh, of South Africa. The first one was in April this year with Sam Lippenberg and David Johnson. So, of course, the, um, you know that the, the topic is very important, of course, socioeconomic rights, and this one specifically uh, about uh, the impact of social rights mitigation. And it ties in closely with the colloquium that's also taking place with questions of interpretation, separation of powers, the role of the courts. Etc. Sorry, Joe. We can't hear you. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So um, that was basically what, uh, what I wanted to say. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, just a few words of. I know this is a welcome, not a thanks, but I want to thank Justice Majid uh, for facilitating this. Uh, also to Imnesa Durjai, who couldn't be here tonight, uh, who co-hosts this uh, event with the Lovell Mount Institute, and then also to, to Cheryl Davids, um, who made many of the arrangements uh, through the Dean's office. Uh, Gladys, uh, uh, we'll do a, a proper thank you later on. So with that done, I'm handing it over to you, Justice Mujib. Thanks very much. Thank you, John. So, I was told to, to be strict with time this evening because unlike judges, uh, academics don't like working after five, so they've had a long day and I must keep it short. Thank you for, for, for being here. As Jacques has said, uh, I started the ball rolling last year with my uh, Dean's Distinguished Lecture. My topic was, quote, dreams and aspirations deferred. That was in quote with a question mark and then the Constitutional Court's approach to the fulfillment of social economic rights in the Constitution. Now, just briefly, I recap as an overview, as a leading to, to my colleagues, and I'd like to thank them up front, Johan Rillerman, uh, former colleague of ours at the court, and uh, Zama Zondo of Seri, who litigates frequently, uh, mostly successfully so in our court. <laughs> now, in that, uh, paper I examined the CC's jurisprudential journey in respect of social and economic rights uh, litigation. I discussed the minimum core versus progressive realization debate. I considered the cases of Suramoni, Khrudbom, TAC2, Nazibuka, and Tubakhane. Uh, and I, I made that sequence deliberately chronological because my a vermin was that there has been a, uh, a, a positive evolution of jurisprudence, although many will, will deny that that is so. I also acknowledge the criticism against the cases, my views on it. I tried to explain and, quite frankly, honestly, to be honest, defend the, court, the court's uh, approach. And I made the point that. Courts, especially the Apex Court, are frequently faced with cases of competing fundamental rights. And I said that the key dilemma for the court in socioeconomic rights and jurisprudence is the effective negation of the severe limitation uh, of rights by resource constraints. And I said that uh, we as an apex court tread with care, and some will say too carefully, um, not to, to violate separation of powers principle, and some people will say that that is a, 
maybe even uh, an overcautious approach. I did also say that I'm setting, getting the ball rolling because I want to invite other speakers with particular those with different views and I true to my word, I do ask Sandy Willenberg and David Purchase to speak on the next uh, occasion and they spoke on South Africa's social economic rights jurisprudence, time for a change of direction, question mark. Now in summary, Professor Liebenberg concluded that she did not believe that the constitution should be valorized, this is all direct quote, nor that the role of the courts in advancing fundamental economic and social transformation should be overstated. Sandy said that the reality is that every day ordinary courts of the law act robustly to protect property rights, freedom of contract and inheritance rights, and these are the rights that largely regulate the translations and protect those that have to have access to income, assets and inherited wealth, and that was the one to do. And she asked, should we not expect our courts to act more robustly in defense and promotion of the rights of those that are excluded from access to the socioeconomic underpinnings of a dignified life? Sandy said that the socioeconomic rights in the Constitution clearly give the courts this mandate, and she opined that the courts, particularly our courts, should reverse their current interpretive trajectory, which weakens this constitutional mandate. And Sandy said, acknowledge that this will not in and of itself transform our society and the economy, but, she said, it can, help, it can help create a legal system that is more responsive to the voices and struggles of those facing social and economic exclusion and injustice. Professor Burchett was typically forthright in his criticism of the, of the CCC, the socioeconomic jurisprudence. He advocated very strongly for a minimum core approach. And uh, he said, our interest in housing and healthcare continues despite that scarcity of resources. That's obviously my direct answer to, to my, to my uh, approach in my lecture. He said, given we cannot meet all our needs due to the scarcity of resources, we asked what are the particular aspects of individual uh, interest in these rights which have a particular residency. We can't just say these rights should disappear uh, when there are no resources or should be minimized. Regarding the reasonableness approach in the Constitution, Professor Bolchitz argued that a very strong reason to jettison this approach is to recognize the results that it is having on the jurisprudence surrounding good socioeconomic rights. He noted that we, only, we have only a handful of cases in 27 years of the, of the Constitution, Constitution's existence, which deals with the actual obligation of the government positively to assist in the realization of socioeconomic rights. And he says this is untenable in a country with grinding poverty. And he used the example of Colombia and said individuals should increasingly have the right to challenge the deprivation of these rights directly. And he noted that the Constitution included socioeconomic rights for a reason. It recognized that they were universal, universal entitlements to live a decent life, and also recognized that they were absolutely necessary to correct the many injustices of the past. He said the Constitutional Court needs to seriously rethink its current approach to uh, socioeconomic rights, and he hoped that it will ensure that these rights are not merely paper promises. And so, this evening, with that long introduction, we conclude this lecture series with the presentations by Nuzamu Sandu, Executive Director of Series of Set, and my retired colleague, Johan Furman. They will speak on assessing the impact of social rights litigation in South Africa. Now, just to introduce Nuzamu, um, I've already told you that she litigates the Chief uh, Institute, for which I have high regard, uh, litigates extensively in, in the all courts of particular institution, uh, in the Constitutional Court. Nzamo Zondo is an attorney and the executive director of SERI, as we know it for short. She joined SERI in February 2013 to fulfill a long, li lifelong dream to work with exploited and marginalized communities using the law to balance the scales of social justice. She works mainly on housing rights cases, defending communities threatened with eviction, and litigating for the provision of basic services and the upgrading of informal settlements. She notes one of her key achievements as uh, the South African Informal Traders, Traders Forum case, which you will be familiar with, uh, which set out to reverse the removal of 1,200 traders from the Joburg Business District in 2013. Also representing the families of the deceased Marikana mine workers, which you are all familiar with, and coordinating criminal defense and support of the Feasmas Forum, which students here will particularly be uh, 
that you are familiar with. The practice of the law has highlighted the need to amplify community voices in public investigation and she is recognized for agitating for legal representation that supports and strengthens the agency of communities and movements. She hasn't added it here, but I would like to think that uh, the Tupacale case is one of her achievements, notwithstanding the disappointing outcome in the Constitutional Court. And so I, I ask you to welcome Muzama Zandu, who will speak to us first. Thank you to everyone who's here. Uh, thank you, Justice Majid. Um, Tupacale is only but a heartbreak. I'm not sure about achievements, um, but I think in, in thinking of this invitation, I know that had a lot to do with it, with being here, uh, you being receiving this invitation. But it also had a lot to do with my acceptance of the invitation. Uh, I'm already in such platforms. Uh, I'm not an academic. Um, by my the way my mind is is structured, I'm a practitioner. Uh, I'm a hired kind of the poor. Uh, so it was very difficult to think, oh, what am I gonna say when I get there? Um, but really, I, I, I don't want there to be any doubt, uh, just as my digit, the judgment that you gave into Bahari, and even the courage to come and face our clients and deliver it despite the outcome, is one of the reasons why I'm here today. Um, because I'd worked on that case for nine years, uh, I started working as I joined Seri. Um, but more specifically, there is a quote from the judgment, uh, which I think continues to propel Sarah's work today, two years post Bahana, that I'd just like to read. Um, it says it is a compulsive trauma, including the violence of the removal itself, the difficulty of setting up in a new place, and the ongoing depriva deprivation associated with having severe from the social and physical resources needed for survival. For the remedial purposes of socioeconomic rights to be properly served, the trauma of removal and resettlement must be considered when practical solutions to socioeconomic problems are sought. And really, I, I really struggled uh, just to think what I would say here, how I would frame my presentation. And um, I thought to decline this invitation to, to let down the large team at Seri. 26 practitioners who are mostly young, uh, who believe in the transformative power of the Constitution, who on a daily basis um, act in a way that confirms their belief that it's all arms of government who can realize the constitutional vision. Um, and they do that in a way that says, we know that you can heal the divisions of the past and establish a society based on democratic values, social justice, and fundamental human rights, and improve the quality of life of all citizens. And Sarah is not alone in this. Uh, we are part of a big sector of public interest legal services organizations. We are here hosted by the Dulama Institute, which is one of those institutions. In fact, uh, one of its, uh, which I think should be one of its claims uh, to fame, is that it provided Sarah with three directors in her lifetime Professor Liebenberg, Professor Daniel Chilwa, uh, and one of our existing um, directors, um, Professor Lillian Chen. So we have a very strong uh, and long history with the Dulama Institute. And of course, another Kumakono officer is also here, Professor Claren. Uh, so I'm under a lot of pressure. Uh, <laughs> I'm worried that one of the existing board members will be told, ah, 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 she must go home. Um, and I'm just, I think it's also in a day like this of not feeling good enough. Um, in the 10 years of the urban theory, that feeling has come a couple of times. Uh, it would have come in December 2021, but it came often. And when it did, uh, Stuart Wilson, one of the founders of SERI, always say to me, Namza, because of the work that you do, there are seven people living in Soweto, a family of seven in Soweto that has a roof over their head. And I always wondered why he would count seven, that he would not count the thousand informal traders, not far, count the hundred, the hundred households in Jubakali, or, or count the thousands of people living in the inner city of Johannesburg. And it was always important, and it is even today, it's very important to break down the realization of social economic rights to individuals, um, especially those individuals who find themselves in the margins of poverty. And that's really where I wanted to start on this idea of impact, right? That, our fixation with the impacts of socioeconomic rights 
is not to have great judgments, like the one written by Justice Majid in Tuakhali, uh, or the one that was written by Justice Bonman um, in, oh, what's that? It just, it just went like this. Um, it is, it's not, it's not clear time. It is, um, it's not about that. It's about whether the lives of individual people living in South Africa have changed. And that's been our fixation. And I wanted, because the Tubakhali heartbreak made it very difficult for me to be here today, I wanted to go back to someone else's heartache. And I felt like Khorpom was an easy one. I imagine the litigators who litigated Khorpom would have felt how I felt in December 2021, would have felt heartbroken, would have felt they disappointed their clients, would have felt they could have made different decisions to convince the court to get a different conclusion. But to then sit here and be able to count the impact of football, to say, yes, someone might have had, might have felt bound in 2001. But already in 2004, you have the introduction of breaking new ground, which is in addition to the National Housing Code, which already introduces the um, e upgrade of former segments program that introduces the emergency housing program that practitioners and myself even today have built on one to protect the rights um, of informal settlement dwellers, like we did in the case of um, Melanie versus City of Johannesburg, or on every day to make sure that people who are threatened with eviction have their right to have a home guaranteed. Um, and so it was like sitting here thinking, but it, was, it, it has gone even beyond that, that even though we had a, a, a robust debate last time in April, where uh, Prof. Lippenberg was clear to say you need a, a value-laden reasonableness inquiry. Khorpom without that could today be the roots of a debate across the country around land distribution. Mm. Could be the reason why property owners to this day are fighting pie tooth and nail, mm. despite, despite our dissatisfaction. And so I had to I had to stop the, the clock. With all that having been said. Um, without even me counting the impact of hot bomb on uh, um, litigation and jurisprudence around uh, mortgage foreclosures, is that despite our complaints about the adjudication of social criminals in South Africa, many poor, poor people have used them to state their claims. Many poor, poor people have had their homes protected by them. Many poor people have, have been able to protect their assets out of that jurisprudence. And, um, and so I think if, if the ANC was here, they would say, we have a good story to tell. And immediately my concern was, okay, so if we have a good story to tell, then why are you here? And I, listening to Justice Majid, listening to Prof. Bilship, listening to Prof. Liebenberg, what I kept hearing in words and lines was the question court says, it's not our job. It's not our place. It's not our identity. And I felt like the only way to kind of resolve that would be to go back to the beginning. To think about when we start to build our constitutional framework, what was in the forefront of the people's mind, what was in the forefront of the constitutional assembly. And so it was quite interesting going back and reading the documents and, and, hear, and, and, and hearing this almost quick and easy acceptance that Separation of powers means that the different arms of government hold each other accountable. It prioritizes openness. Um, even within, 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 I think, three, three months of deliberations, those that were involved in the Constitutional Assembly were agreeing that the judiciary would safeguard the Constitution, that the role of the judiciary would be to protect human rights. And so I was left with the question, so if that was the case, if that was the initial intention, why does it feel like in some of these cases that have been litigated, it's been litigants against the court, sometimes against the constitution, mm -hmm. and you don't actually have a situation where the court at each and every stage is standing with the constitution. Mm -hmm. and, I, and, 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 and one of the things I, was, I always find uh, you know, preamble so beautiful is that the preamble to the, to the Interim Constitution 
were also very clear that actually the interim constitution is a bridge, right? Mm. Kind of assuming that you would start on the one end where we were in 1993 or in 1994 or in 1996 when the constitution starts. But then you would get to the other side of the rainbow or the other side of the bridge, would be, which would be a very different future. Uh, a future that's a founded on the recognition of human rights, democracy, and peace, peaceful coexistence, development opportunities for all South Africans, irrespective of color, race, class, or belief. And reflecting on the intended role of the, of the Constitutional Court as a champion of the Constitution, I, I had things that I wanted to see. One, I wanted to see a Constitution that was paying attention to history especially questions of land dispossession, questions of agency, questions of uh, looking at disenfranchisement and also the racial allocation of resources. And I knew that what I would come against, up against almost quickly, would be the question of property. Because even in our question of dispensation, the treatment of property, it's almost as if it's the holy grail. You can't touch it. And it's so difficult um, now because we are in a situation where the property relations in South Africa in 2022 look very similar to what they did in 1994. And, and um, in, in, in 2017, the, there was a land audit just only of private ownership. Land audit of only private ownership would only cover 39% of the land in South Africa. And it's an underlying only private ownership. And that land audit report was clear that over 70% of the land that is privately held, so held by individuals, is in white hands. Only about 4% is in African hands. And the balance is segregated, uh, almost, almost proportional, colored, Indian, other. And so there was a question of, so if, if, we, if we're gonna talk about property, if we are gonna to continue to protect uh, property, what does that mean for our project against inequality? What does that mean for our transformative project? But then at the end, it's important to close the loop on the bridge. So then if the bridge starts at the ugly end, at the broken end, at the repressed end, at the strip of humanity, dignity end, it must land on the other side. Um, we can't just, only think about the past, maybe think about the present, we must start to look at what does the future look like. And um, I was actually then uh, quite encouraged uh, by the court's, the Constitutional Court's judgment in Dennis's Scribanti. And it was in, in that judgment actually that Justice Cameron was challenged by the fact that both uh, the majority judgment of Justice Matanga uh, the, judgment, the judgment that uh, Justice Foreman wrote, look at the history without being invited by the parties, without even a directive being issued to the parties to say, actually, can you, can you address us on these issues uh, of the history of, of, of dispossession in South Africa and what it means? And um, again, it's another beautiful quote where he says, in the recent period, the Constitutional Court, um, sorry, I apologize, he says, because neither of my colleagues' historical account may be taken or could be expected to be taken as other than partial and incomplete reflections of our country's fractured past, they are neither impartial nor complete. Yet our country's history is omnipresent when no one applies the Constitution and the reparative legislation that flowed from it. That history is not always directly functional to the determination of the case, yet it often cries out for a voice. And I'm saying this because in my experience as a practitioner, um, including in the Constitutional Court, I've had very few instances where the state's case, the state's opposition to the relief that is sought, is about scarcity of resources. Uh, whether it's about the validity of the constitutional rights claims that have been made. In, 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 in effect, the, the executive is, has very much divorced and abandoned the Constitution, which is part of the reason why my case here today is about the Constitution needs to be championed again. Mm. It needs to be championed by the Constitutional Court. It needs to be championed by practitioners 
who are committed to that vision. And in, 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 in thinking about this, um, Justice Froneman, I, I, I thought I would ask him this if it let me uh, refer to him quickly here, speaks about the three things that must be done if we are going to address our past, if we are going to get to the other side of the bridge uh, in Daniel's versus Kibante. And he says, we need an honest and deep recognition of the past injustice. And I'm sure if you've been listening to me, you'll see that my focus has been around socioeconomic rights in the housing context. It has been about land. But in that space, the first thing that if you go to all the judgments, there is almost um, a surprise if people assert their rights not to be removed not to be evicted. As if somehow, if you stood on the other side of 1993, you would have thought, if I'm removed following a court process, it's justice. Whereas quite clearly, no one could have said that. In 1993, when you thought we have won, in 1994, your assumption would be that you, you'd have a right to assert to, that you stay where you are, that your situation of freedom would be protected. And that if worse comes to worse, removal will be the exception of the rule. And in, even if you look at the court's jurisprudence, unfortunately, removal is the rule. And in fact, uh, if you read the court's very recent judgment uh, of Phillips of Schobler, one of the things that was troubling, at least to me, wasn't the outcome. The outcome was great. But the unfortunate part was the fact that the court could sit there and look, how can she have the audacity to, remove, to, refuse, to, to refuse to live a place she's lived in for over seven decades? And that is what, for me, is required. If we're going to recognize the past injustice, we must look at what our past solutions were. We must accept that something needs to change about our property relations. Um, and unfortunately, I don't think um, the court feels empowered to address that. It might say it's not its place. But again, in some of the judgments, sorry, there's a huh? Absolutely. Oh, no. Um, it's okay. I'll, it'll stop distracting me. No problem. And so, in, 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 in thinking about how to move towards a just society, my, my other plea today, why I came here today, was to speak to the practitioners and the future practitioners. To say, actually, we must marry these two things together, the history and the future, um, so that maybe the justices don't feel um, under pressure to be the ones who are bringing up the past, but also they have a picture of the future that you're trying to arrive at. And it is, um, again, because I went back rummaging through history, um, I went back to read the, I think it was the 1997 strategic document, uh, the ANC, and you were speaking about the fears of the ANC at that time, uh, their goals at that time, and their goals were to convince broader society of the crucial vision, to make sure there's a national consensus on the constitution. At that time, their only fear were all the officials that were sitting who had been working in the apartheid government. They did not, I think at that time, foresee that would be the problem that we're in today. That in order for us to reach the other side of the bridge, we not only have to convince the professional court, I mean that I haven't even gotten to this point, that constantly says they are disempowered to act, but we're also against a government who itself has forgotten 
the conscious vision. And if that, if that task lies before us, um, I would want to be able to tell people like Mr. Tukwakhali, that Mr. Tukwakhali, in order for us to reach the other side of the bridge, we need you to assert your power. We need people who will refuse to move to Wolverine or to Delft. We need people who will say, I have a right to be here. And we need to be able to push for property for a, 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 a construction of property rights that doesn't further the interests of the minority and the powerful, but one that actually is, is reconstituted to address the interests of the poor and the majority in this country. Thank you so much. Yeah. Is when I decided on my topic because they invited me to give the distinguished like, Dean's distinguished lecture and said you choose the topic and I having written uh, to Bakhali I must be honest I had not a Damascene conversion but I had a rethink about the enforcement of socioeconomic rights because uh, I've said it to, to, to people close to me and to others uh, to Bakhali is very close to my heart and it made me wonder whether the court is doing enough. But I thought that if I choose this topic and ask others with different views to, to discuss it and to take it further, whether colleagues at the court, for example, but also others could, wouldn't see that as my sort of minority backlash. In other words, to seek vindication for my minority view. But having thought it through carefully, I thought that this is a debate that we must have. And I think it is an important debate, and I think that we should have a diverse voices on it. I think there's nothing wrong, even for a sitting judge of the Constitutional Court, to get this debate wrong, because it's a very, very important debate. And so I'm, I'm probably trying to justify me doing this, but I think there's ample justification uh, if, I give my, if I can give my own verdict of my question. So over to Johan Frodeman. Uh, I asked him for his biography. And he said, in Afrikaans, when I read it in English, he said, please keep it short. And that's typical, Johan. He's one of the most humble human beings I've ever met. Well, here's the little bit that he's prepared to, to, to let me say. He was appointed as a Justice of the Constitutional Court in 2009. He retired from that court in June 2020. Outside of legal practice and his judicial responsibilities, Justice Froneman taught at several universities. For five years, he was Professor Extraordinaire at Stellenbosch University, where he gave lectures on human rights at LLM level. He attended Harvard and Oxford universities in 1999 and 2008, respectively, in a visiting capacity. And at present, he's also an extraordinary professor at the University of Free State, UFS. I think that title describes him very well. He's an extraordinary human being. <laughs> Good evening all. Uh, thank you, Justice Majid, for those kind words. Also, for the Dalla Omar Institute and the law faculty of the uh, UWC uh, for having me here. It's a special privilege to do so at this university. It is a place that was forged in the struggle for freedom and justice. Many people who were and still are at the forefront of working on what socioeconomic rights mean or should mean for our country have their rights in this university or have their roots in this university. I wish to honor them, yourself, and this university. But knowing that and having read the previous lectures in the series, I made my talk task much more difficult on a personal level. Uh, the reason for that is quite simple and straightforward. Uh, I did not know what I could add to the debate that hasn't been said comprehensively and eloquently in the previous lectures. I still do not think that I have anything worthwhile to say at the intellectual and scholarly level that is, uh, of the previous lectures. But fortunately something happened last week that made me realize uh, I don't have to aspire to talk at that level. I've been extremely lucky in my professional life with the things that came my way. And after my retirement, that good, good fortune continued. 
What happened is that I was asked to join the board of two civil society organizations involved in working for constitutional rights to health care and education. It has been and continues to be an enriching and enlightening ex experience. And listening to tonight to Tom Zahman, it is a very special kind of person who does that. Last week, a new member joined the board of one of those organizations. And he's also now well known. He, he's a professor in medicine at BITS. And he, he said, when he was introduced and asked to say something, he said, uh, well, when I started, and he was in pediatrics, he said, well, I thought I'm a professional person. I would be able to fix uh, the problems of children. Uh, but now I've realized that I have had little, very little to do with it, actually. It's all you people. You people who are actively involved in pushing these rights. You are making the changes. And I am honored to be with you. And it's not as if I'm adding anything uh, to your experience. So that is what I talk about tonight. I went and asked the people involved what they considered their most important successes were and how that was achieved. It's mostly going to be their story, not mine. So this talk is a tribute to them and many others who keep our country going in the right direction under very trying circumstances. All and every one of them, even though I will be relying in my talk on the people I've met and known best, but I'm paying tribute to everyone else who are doing the same. And then, just as Majid has made part of my talk a bit more difficult because I thought I'd start off by saying what happened in the previous three lectures. Now, he's, he's, he's given his own spiel on that, time, but, but nevertheless, I'll, I'll do something about it as well. Uh, then after that, I'll say something about uh, the history of poverty in South Africa before I then move on to uh, the experiences of the persons uh, that I mentioned at the outset. Justice Munjit uh, started off by giving the history of how we came, how, how the socio-economic rights were included in the Constitution, and I certainly don't uh, want to repeat that. Uh, he then gave a defense of uh, not having a minimum court obligation, uh, I'm not sure whether he, <laughs> he still thinks that's a good thing because uh, after the other two lectures, he might have been uh, sorry that he said it. But in any event, he said, in closing my disinclination, disinclination towards a minimum core approach and preference for the apex courts approach must now be plain. And then he says he believes it's good for all the reasons that he sets out. But he then also says the way forward. There's a growing lobby of commentators who suggest that the way forward out of our South, South African socio-economic rights adjudicative conundrum, he called it a conundrum, is that determining whether the state is progressively realizing the right does not require courts to specify the means, but rather to develop criteria to assess from a deliberative standpoint the state's definitions, definition of the requirements of the right and the state's explanation of its chosen means to move towards that end. These criteria can be derived from the underlying principles uh, in the Constitution, and he referred to the fundamental values of dignity, equality, and freedom. Uh, Professor Bolchitz, as I read it, he started with a story, and he located the, the, the lecture in the story of two people, and he explained what, what they were, the one standing next to the road, and asked, so, he said, I imagine many of these stories are recognizable to you. And then, we should always test our theories and intuitions against what they mean concretely for people. And I think Gonzalo has told us very eloquently and passionately the same sort of thing tonight. Courts should consider and engage with the position of these people and not simply stand back in an ivory tower. We should also challenge theoretical abstractions that do not adequately address the issues raised in those stories. Then he came to the minimum core, 
And as Justice Majid said, he was pretty forthright about it. He said, my core argument it is that it is the duty of the Constitutional Court to give effect to the fact that socioeconomic rights are fundamental rights. The Constitutional Court is thus far failing miserably in giving effect to the transformative power of socioeconomic rights through its reasonable approach. Conservative, conservative judicial culture, as predicted by Carl Clare, is stunting the possibilities of those rights. And then he goes on and he says, he gave six criticisms, which I like to repeat. Then <laughs> Professor Liebenberg also joined with what I see as all three speakers' uh, assessment. She said, despite the early promise of judgments such as Hartburn, DAC, Causa, and so forth, our socio-economic Christ jurisprudence, specifically on the positive duties imposed by sections 26 and 27 of the Constitution, has been on a downward trajectory, starting with the Massapequa judgment and a down in 2009. And I remember some of her comments after that judgment, which can't be repeated here. <laughs> this trajectory reached a low point with the majority judgment in Tugahari. And then she said, in this lecture I will try and convince you that the reasonableness of view can still serve as a basis for adjudicating the positive duties imposed by socioeconomic rights, but only if it undergoes a fundamental reorientation towards the normative purposes of socioeconomic rights. Without this re reorientation, I fear that we are approaching a point where these rights will be incapable of playing a meaningful role in helping counter the current drift away from South Africa's transformative constitutional project. And then something else that I took uh, from her lecture, she says, making meaning of socioeconomic rights. As is the case, Case with all human rights, identifying the purpose of socio-economic rights requires a process of interpretation. This process is inevitably situated within the context of the history, present realities and future aspirations of a particular interpretive community. And once again, I, having listened to Nomzama, where it's coming through. In other words, articulating the purposes of human rights requires an ongoing process of meaning-making, which is inextricably linked to an expressed or implicit understanding of the past, the present, and the future of the societies in which these rights are embedded. So that's my, that's my summary of those lectures. Then I want to say something about the history of poverty uh, in South Africa. Uh, and I've read a little book <laughs> or booklet, and m much of what I'm going to say about that comes from that. It's often stated or assumed that pre colonial African societies were so egalitarian that no poverty existed. And perhaps implicit in that assumption is the further one namely, that once decolonization is complete, there will be a return to a state from where poverty will have disappeared. I'm afraid to say that neither proposition is correct. The historian Colin Bundy, who, whose little book I read called Poverty in South Africa, Past and Present, uh, examines the pre-colonial and, and, and early colonial history of South Africa, and he's very forthright about it. He says, it demonstrates that chapter, firstly, that the notion, notion of pre-colonial African society so egalitarian that no poverty existed is simply wrong. And secondly, patterns of accumulation and poverty were far from static or unchanging in those societies. And I, don't, I, I haven't got the time, but he, he sets that out in his, in his history. He then traces the history of poverty poverty through early colonial times and examines the immediate and long-term implications for poverty of colonial wars and dispossession during the British colonial 19th century. And he says, the most crucial, crucial change of the closing decades of the 19th century was that urban whites, settler farmers and African subsistence farmer pastoralists became effectively integrated into one single, rapidly modernizing economy and would continue to be irrevocably bound together. 
central to this process was, quote, the incorporation of the Af African people to provide the indis indispensable labor for that modern economy. And then in the following chapters, he deals with the so-called poor white problem, with black poverty before 1948, and then with some startling changes in the nature of poor poverty during the four decades of the apartheid. Important for present purposes is the change that occurred in the late 1970s and 80s, according to him. And that is when rural and urban poverty intensified, not so much as a result of policy, but as, as a result of a failing economy and major changes within the labor market. Empl employers who were for, de for decades had relied on cheap, unskilled labor now tried to increase production through mechanization and the employment of more highly skilled workers. Earnings for urban insiders rose significantly, but were affordable because employers were shedding unskilled and semi-skilled workers in the hundreds of thousands. There was, a historic, there was an, an historic shift from labor shortages to a labor surplus, which translated into mass structural unemployment. Mass poverty rooted in mass unemployment was thus a crucial element of the legacy inherited by the ANC from four and a half decades of apartheid. And then in the last two chapters of the little book, he explores the response of successive ANC governments to this grim legacy bequeathed by apartheid. In the one, he deals with what he calls the ANC's remarkable expansion of welfare provision. In 1993, about 3 million people received pensions or social grants. By 2016, pensions and grants reached almost 18 million people, or one in three South Africans. Welfare cash, trans welfare cash transfers have arguably been the most effective mechanism of redistribution used by the ANC. But he says there's a problem. The major shortcoming of the social security net is that it has replicated welfare systems which assume full, full, uh, full employment. It was not designed to provide for the long-term long unemployed. Accordingly, the long-term unemployed, especially young men, are almost entirely excluded from the system of welfare grants. Then he deals with the broader front. And he states that the ANC had to wage an attritional trench warfare on three linked fronts, poverty, inequality, and unemployment. The modest gains it has made in reducing poverty have been offset, according to him, by a failure to take any ground on the other two front, uh, fronts, namely inequality and unemployment. And then in conclusion, he addresses the question of what policy options are available to any South African government trying to reduce poverty, and unemployment and inequality. He does not give a specific solution, but leaves us with a daunting problem that we face. To what extent are domestic solutions to this triad of challenges compromised by the prevailing logic of globalized capitalism? Can an ANC government simultaneously serve the interests of black empowerment capitalists, black middle class professionals, workers who are typically skilled and unionized, and the unemployed and the poor? If unemployment obviously keeps people poor, what realistic prospects are there for more successful public work programs or other forms of job creation? And then he says, any positive answer to such questions will require a political solution, not a technical one. There would have to be a realignment of political forces that would make a fundamental policy shift possible, one that seeks structural solutions to structural problems. So the reason why I referred to the, the previous three lectures is there, that there was some agreement, uh, even though uh, Judgment, as Justice Majid said that he was a bit criticized, but there was some agreement that the court is not, not doing what everybody hoped it is doing. What we learn from this little bit of history on, 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 on poverty 
is that the other arm, other arms of government, the legislative arm and the executive arm of government, is also not doing what it's supposed to do. So the three branches of government are not doing what they're supposed to do. What, if, what are we going to do? Who, 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 who's going to do the job? And that's a question we must ask. If the three branches of government have failed to give proper meaning and implementation of socio-economic rights, who else can do it? And I think the answer is simple, only ourselves. And to, and to find out what has been done and what can be done, I have asked the leaders of the civic organizations that I have had the fortune of uh, uh, acting with, what they, what they regard as their achievements and successes. And this is what they have to say. That's what I said. This talk is really about what they say. I basically asked them three things whether uh, what they thought about the, the impact of their litigation, whether they had any influence on the policy uh, of, of government departments, and their interaction with communities. And there are two organizations that are not, uh, I have to declare my interest, but it's simply because I, I'm there. Uh, the one is Section 27, but we had a, a wonderful talk by Nunzam. There are many other organizations. Uh, and also, what I want to mention is that I'm, I'm quoting three persons from these organizations, and they're all women. So, right at the start, when, we, when I asked who's going to do it, let's leave it to the woman. <laughs> uh, Sasha Stevenson is uh, more to do with the health aspect of, 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 of Section 27. She said, as far as the first question is concerned, litigation in the courts, uh, important for her was the recent case on pregnant women and children under six being able to access healthcare services regardless of citizenship or documentation. Uh, and recently she said that that, is, that has worked in Barabona. There is now uh, a, a notice to say that uh, anybody can, can be coming in for those services. So she regards that as one of the uh, important aspects. The other one was the life is the many arbitration uh, was in, uh, important for recognizing mental health care services use, uh, users' rights. And then she says, I'm particularly proud of our litigation in the Siki Siki village clinic case, which is basically where they were going to close the, uh, the, the, the clinic in the Siki Siki. And the people, the community responded and said, no, you can't do that. And eventually, uh, if they succeeded, a new, a new clinic was then built. As far as assistance and interaction with government on policy issues are concerned, she mentioned uh, the work of Stop Stock Out Project, which is, <laughs> seems to me, taking stock of what, what is there in regard to uh, making medication and health uh, uh, available. And then she said our negotiations with National and Gauteng Treasury and National and Gauteng Departments of Health got 784 million allocated to cancer and surgical backlogs, paving the way for new policy on outsourcing of care. Unfortunately, there's not such a good uh, update on that. When we spoke last week about that, that money is supposed to be available, or is available, but nothing's been done with it. Uh, and then she says we pretty much re rewrote the emergency medical services re regulations and so forth. As far as community interaction is concerned, she says work with TAC is a good example of getting law into communities. I work with the Life is the Many Family Committee and the COVID vaccine literary advocacy. Then the next uh, female leader is Farina Zberavia. She referred to litigation as uh, the national nutrition case uh, in national education versus Minister of Basic Education. Then also the involvement in Blind SA versus Minister of Trade and Industry. Thirdly, the Kumar litigation. 
as far as assistance and interaction with government on policy issues are concerned. Uh, she mentioned that they interviewed in a scholar transport case initiated by Equal Education, another civil rights sort of organization. But she says the most impactful policy intervention that I've involved with has not been at Section 27. It was in the 2000s during my team time at Cowles at WITS. It was on the reform of the school funding framework that resulted in fee-free schooling in 60% of the poorest schools. As far as community interaction uh, is, she, she mentioned that working with Blind SA is, 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 is a, was very special and is very special because she says there's often a, 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 a criticism of lawyers leading organizations or community organizations. She said, not with Blind SA, <laughs> they, the blind were leading them. Then I come to uh, a different organization that I have also had the privilege of being involved with. It's called One to One Africa. I don't know whether anybody knows about it, but uh, it's a wonderful, uh, wonderful story, which I'll say, say more about it. It basically involves the, uh, some villages in the Transkei. Where, they, where there are no, cl uh, no clinics, they're too far away from every, everything, too far away from clinics, too far away from hospitals. They haven't got transport to get there. So what One to One Africa has started, do, uh, started doing is to uh, what they call a mentor mothers project. So they, uh, they, they give training to women in those villages on what it is, what is being a good mother, so that these people can go into the villages and, and then interact with, with pregnant women and mentor them on essential food, play, and, and the like. And if, they're there, if there is then a problem, then they help with the trans transport to the, to the clinics. So this is what she said, and I want to quote. I asked her about the successes of one-to-one. -one. This is what she says. There are many ways to feed women, or so the philosophers would have us believe. Give a person a fish, and you feed them for a day. Teach them how to fish, and you'll feed them for life. I take it a step further. Give them bait, and you'll feed them today and in perpetuity. At One to One Africa, we believe in the extended version and what that entails. It means going beyond the call of our duty as our job descriptions dictate. It means having the eyes to see what our team of mentor mothers encounter every day. The ability to hear what our team tells us about the challenges faced by the people we serve in the last mile communities, nice word for those villages, the last mile communities, and most importantly, the willingness to not only be responsive, but in a manner that is empowering for our clients. And then she sets out some of what she considers the achievements. And Stephen, you must tell me if I'm taking too long. Since 2016, when we launched the Enable Initiative, our, some of our accomplishments include, one, uh, we limited, eliminated mother to child HIV uh, transmission, very close to completely. We've reduced the maternal mobility from over 30% to less than 1%. More than 95% of pregnant women know their HIV st status and the like. But it's not only the mentor mothers program, they've also, also got a mentor fathers program to involve men in the community to assist with that. So I'm not going further on that. I just want to uh, quote the last bit that she said. A lesser recorded and communicated yet equally noteworthy accomplishment is the empowerment, financial independence and subsequent agency experienced by our field team known as mentor mothers. This team comprises rural women, many of whom are living with HIV, have received limited education, 
and dismal employment prospects. Their role has made them esteemed members of their communities, identif identified by their neon going green shirts as a source of assistance. Their thriving is a major source of pride and achievement for us at One to One Africa. So I've quoted and let these people tell their own stories, but I've also asked them about the impact and how you, how you do it. And we can talk about it later, but Sasha uh, gave a lecture, I think at Nottingham University, where she said, spoke about the strategy, and, 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 and Nunzano will know much more about this. Uh, she said the cases showed, starting with the early HIV litigation, showed the opportunities for public health from strategic, uh, strategic lit litigation, defining content of the right to health, demonstrating health system implications, challenging public and private power, highlighting the obligation to cater to the needs of the most vulnerable, etc., etc. Uh, you can see I'm just turning over. <laughs> A foreigner asked did the same for me, and uh, I'm not going to uh, quote from it, that uh, she and Irina Ali from uh, UST wrote an article called Legal Mobilization for Education in the Time of COVID. Uh, I suggest that you read that because it also sets out how they see their future role. And then I come back to one to one and Gibelo Dandala, who was the other woman there. They are busy with a project involving the provincial and national health department. Uh, 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 the provincial and local health departments in the Transkei because uh, the uh, training of community workers in clinics in, in, in the Eastern Cape has not been successful and they are working closely and hopefully by the end of the year, next year, the Transkei is going to take over their, their model or the Eastern Cape uh, Department of Health will take over their model uh, in training these uh, people at the local level. So, I've come to the end. What is to be done? First of all, and that's not something I'm going to talk about, a political realignment. Democracy must work at that level. Uh, I'd say something about it. I've been at the, uh, uh, in Gavaron at the Botswana Appeal Court, and what struck me there is reading the newspapers. And they, the government has a specific plan. They say we're a middle income country, and by 2036 we want to be a rich and income uh, country, and we're going to do this by X, Y, and Z. I don't know whether we have that kind of strategy from any of our political parties. As far as litigation strategies are concerned, uh, what what these people tell, tell tell me is you must create the right story. If you've got the right story, you've got the facts, and they and they simply shout out for uh, assistance and for justice, then you're probably going to get it. And in doing that, you create. Uh, a minimum call because that precedent is going to be followed. Uh, so a different aspect of minimum call is being established by the correct litigation strategies. Uh, and then obviously monitor for compliance and uh, forge new remedies. And uh, the minimum requirement, I just want to add there, they, they said one of the important things is that uh, relying on the no regression principle, especially in the education cases in the Eastern Cape, is you can't go backwards. You must at least stay at, the, at what, you, what you were, and that is also some kind of, of minimum requirement. Uh, what's the other one? Engage policy makers and public health experts on a policy level and interact with communities. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Johan. So we have moved from where I started with uh, 
as people say, defending the court's jurisprudence, but suggesting that there is a certain way we could move forward to a uh, discussion on minimum core uh, principle and re the reasonableness, minimum core David Burchett's uh, reasonableness as having scope to vote for, for, for socioeconomic rights to be enforced uh, a la Sassani Liebenberg. And this evening you've heard very practical examples of the impact of uh, socio-economic rights litigation progression or stagnation, as uh, depending on the, your perspective. And so I'm going to open for questions. We we are almost at ten past seven. I, we're trying to finish by half past seven if we could. As I said, just bear in mind the academics said. Uh, Jacques told me the academics are not used to working this late, unlike judges. So they've had a full day session from about what an hour, nine o'clock. So. Let's consider the academics and how we as students and judges could possibly probably, uh, stay much later, but considering the academics, let's try and go for half past seven as a cutoff. These have been very uh, stimulating, practical inputs, and so I'm going to open to the floor. If somebody can just organize a roving mic and uh, load the questions. I need a piece of paper. I have uh, put away my stuff, please. Can I have a okay. Good evening, my name is Tamara Skewitz. Um, defending democracy, I think, is a slap in the face of women and the poor in our country. Just last Thursday, in this province, theatres were cancelled because of a taxi strike. How many women did not reach theatre because theatre time were cancelled? How many children didn't die because they were born plain babies? So the reality of litigation, we don't know. Litigation is only when somebody really stepped forward. But those women in our facilities, like in the Transkai, where women died in those villages, because a helicopter couldn't even reach them. So my question and my concern as a human rights defender is, what are we doing to ensure we strengthen those on the floor, on the ground? Because when I was called to Tigerberg, I got out of my bed, I went, I called the minister and I said, come, I'm standing here. Theatre is cancelled because there's no staff. She couldn't do anything because there wasn't staff. So the reality for women, and especially rural women, and litigation is something the Constitutional Court needs to get the act together according to the Constitution of this country and fulfill the role why they were established. Thank you. Uh, uh, my name is Siabu, I'm just uh, no, I, I, I simply have two questions. Uh, the first is to Mrs. Zonda. Um, and you said, or you touched on the issue of property being treated as some sort of a, a holy grail, uh, something that is untouchable in a sense. And I think that's also quite uh, evident looking at the wording of Section 25 as well. And yeah, how the drafters of the Constitution uh, went, around, went about that particular thing. But my question then is, then what is to be done? And is the Constitutional Court, or do you believe the Constitutional Court is ready to take a turn towards putting the interests and the needs of uh, the poor and the people in general uh, when they are applying the law and when they are dealing with uh, uh, so, 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 so socioeconomic rights litigation and all of that? Then my second question is to Justice Farnham. Uh, <laughs> Okay, 
This one I started by saying, wait, poverty is not just a result of colonialism. Uh, poverty is also a result of the imperialist and capitalist project, taking into consideration the fact that colonialism in itself is a product of capital. So, do socio-economic rights uh, address that? And if so, how does the APEX court assist in giving them effect? Um, on, a, on a historical uh, as, yeah, aspect as well as moving forward as well, do you think perhaps the Cautional Court should somewhat take a different route when dealing with that? Thank you. One more and then we'll, one more and then we'll give answers and then another. Thank you. I just want to associate myself with the last point. Because when I try to work out the connection between these, but thank you so much for both of you. Um, it seems to me that what Johan's talking about, particularly in relation to the Bundy book, which is a nice introduction to poverty, is the fundamental structural problem of the country, which, which the first comment is all about, in, in a sense that people just get left out because of the structural problem. And I, and then you spoke about social economic rights uh, you know, in, 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 in some of the really very progressive litigation. And perhaps it's precisely because I was a judge in the first court, and probably quite uniquely, um, thanks to Zaki Achwant, when we were all over, I addressed a mass gathering in this with Mrs. Kruitboom on the stage, in which I tried to have to explain to her why she never got a house. And you might remember she died without ever getting a house. And it's just like Steve was troubled by the fact that he was in the minority. That has always troubled me. And so the question I really have is I, I'm, I'm really not that interested. I'm not suggesting that uh, minimum call or reasonableness aren't important or social economic rights are that or not important. But fundamentally at core, a transformative constitutional project is a recalibration of the entire economy. It, it can't just be that we fiddle around with cases. And, you know, it's quite relatively easy to do, even Scribanti, which is really ma magisterial judgments by, by both Justice Madlanka and, and Justice Froneman. But actually they're relatively easy in the sense that you think, well, <coughs> Of course, you should be given permission to do this. Far much more problematic <coughs> is how do we actually use the Constitution to lead to recalibrate the allocation and distribution of resources in the society at large. And until we start thinking about social common rights in that way, and we're still thinking about the fact of separation of powers in a transformative, radical way, which informs that, I fear that we will always be fiddling around with liberal legality, which has some advantages, but nothing much more than that. And I don't want to disparage it, they're really important. But I just can't help feeling we're going to get more Mrs. Kurtbooms and more uh, cases of the kind that you're fighting unless we look at, lift our gaze to something far more radical. I am going to give to my colleagues to answer, but I just want to say this. Dennis spoke uh, in conjunction with the two previous questioners, but I think he's right. Uh, and Tubakale opened my eyes to say that, because the point for me in Tubakale uh, was that Hrulbom said the court will do no more, can do no more than interrogate your housing plan and your housing policies. Then the policies followed. The, you spoke about the Housing Code came 2003, 2004, the Housing Act. And in Tubakale, I said, well, we've moved on from Khurutbun. The policies are in place and so now it's implementing. And my question, or the, the rhetorical question that I asked myself, like, I'm not going to answer it because those cases are going to come and I'll have to sit and decide them and I've got an open mind. But the day is going to come when you're going to have to interrogate the budget dinners, you're going to have to interrogate uh, the policies, and you're going to have to interrogate the plans. Now, 
People will say, but you have no capacity to interrogate the budget when you don't understand what the needs are within any, every component within the department. Because those of us who know a little bit about the budgets, and you would probably be the best place of all of us here, except those who have worked in government, know that a lot of inputs go into the budget, theoretically, but I don't know when it still happens. And so who is a court, even the highest court, to come and say, well, I'm going to interrogate your budget and say, well, this component, you don't need so much for training, and you don't need so much for SATs, and you don't need so much for X, Y, Z. And so it's a very difficult question, but I think the time is going to come when you ask the question. Well, it says progressive realization, but has there been progressive realization? Show us your budget. Show us your budget of five years ago. Show us your budget of ten years ago. It says reasonable means, and that's the point that Sandy made. You know. Within, what is reasonableness? When does it become unreasonable for a, for a department to say, well, our cake is smaller? And uh, is, a judge not, is a judge wrong to say, well, why is it smaller? Is it not because you have either stolen or you have, uh, what is the, uh, I'm thinking in Afrikaans now, your honey was helping. You have misappropriated or you have uh, misspent uh, at this for you. With that, in my, uh, I'm, going to, uh, I'm going to ask uh, Nomsamo to uh, answer. I'll say one half point, Steve. Yes. I recommend to people that they reread Etienne Uranik's famous article mm. in yes. 1994. Yes. Because what did he say? He said, what do socio-economic rights do? They allow you to, government's got a justified policy. Mm. What was the example he gave? Mm. He said that government buys submarines, yes. right? Mm -hmm. And rather than food for people. Mm -hmm. Surely a court can say, why do we need submarines? Remember, he wrote that before the arms camp. Before the arms camp. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to make that. It point. was prophetic. <laughs> so I, I think we are getting to that point. Just Davis, when we are going to come to say, I use the maximum resources towards social economic rights. <coughs> and for me, the reason that I'm still invested in the Constitution is that the Constitution itself is an, is an outcome of struggle. Um, and in as much as, for instance, you, you're saying it's, a, it's about the recalibration of the economy, that recalibration can't happen in the Constitutional Court. It can't happen at SERI, it can't happen at Section 27, it can't happen one to one. That recalib recalibration of the economy will happen in the discussion of the political relationships. And the question is in our work, how does our work engage the recalibration of the political relationships? And the, and the work that Seri has been doing in the last 10 years has been about getting people who are in this country to say, my voice matters and I can act towards my interests. And, and that's the most that we can do as a small NGO sitting in Johannesburg. Um, but in, in, in the question about can we, can we get the Koshar Court to move on the question of property rights, uh, on the prioritization of the property rights of the poor? Um, I think it's definitely, it's definitely an argument that we need to make to them to say, look, when you think, when you consider, I mean, the one thing uh, I was thinking of a month ago, I was in a conference with people from across the continent, and they were saying, you know, when you think of Southern Africa, and probably East Africa as well, the issues of land dispossession are worse than in West Africa, where basically what happens is the colonizers left, and people left were left to kind of have access to land. Even today, in terms of when they think, I can't educate my kids, they can say, I can sell a plot and, and recover. But in this country, we need a, an, an adjustment, right, where we recognize the use of property, we recognize the social value of property more than who, whose name is on a title deed. Especially if it's as it is now, that I think the, the numbers, the, the report that I spoke about earlier says uh, only about six million people uh, are sitting on the deeds registry, or at least people in, in six million households are recognized in the, in the deeds registry's office. The rest are not. Um, and that is a basis for us to argue that actually then in engaging with property, you must start at the floor. Look at the common denominator, which is use, and then engage maybe about a future of saying how do we get recognized across the spectrum. Um, and that, I, I'm hoping that's a sufficient response to your question. Uh, I think, uh, I'll stay honest, it is really, really difficult, but I think for me, um, the issue is the social contract, right? Of even the minister to say, the minister to say, I don't know what to do. You would hope that the minister has a plan in place to address that crisis. 
and I understand that it's not really, it's not only a crisis about service in the health department. That's a crisis about what's happening in this country politically. The fact that we are actually sitting in a moment where there's the language of violence is the language that is understood. Yeah. That's why people couldn't get to the hospital, right? More than the, the competence of the minister, the competence of the staff, it was about that language of violence. And all of those things are manifesting because of the break in the social contract. That in the relations that we have as citizens in the state, we find ourselves in that. Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask you to answer a question about poverty, not being just a uh, cause of apartheid. But uh, some, somebody said that uh, you have to bring the right case, uh, your hand said, uh, and so establish a minimum court because you'll be setting precedent. And uh, it's important to bring the right case to court. Earlier on in the previous session, uh, I think Hank Wota said, uh, you know, it would be nice if uh, was it in, uh, in the New Nation movement, if the court could have said something beyond what was before it to be adjudicated. Now, um, we employ judicial economy and we decide the case in front of us. And if the right case comes along, we can, we can decide whether the electoral system is constitutional or not. Uh, the court is hesitant to, to give over the detail. I just want to be a bit facetious and say that I see that uh, civil society organizations, what they are doing now is a new strategy. They take a retired justice of the constitutional court and they say, listen man, you people are not moving in that court. Come and be a consultant here, come, come and work for us so that you can show us what to do so that we can get to move now that you are gone. So you are... <laughs> I'm not a consultant. <laughs> As to your question about the, the historic consequences of colonialism and imperialism and so forth, uh, yes, of course, steps must be taken to redress it. Uh, but I think it, uh, the criticism of the Constitutional Court is perhaps a bit harsh because the Constitutional Court uh, can't do everything. They can make things easier and they can redefine how we think about prop the property and, and, and the like. And I think it's important that they do so, so that uh, <coughs> other organizations and people can use that and build upon it. But I don't really have the answer because uh, from that little bit that I, that I read is about the mass unemployment that we have in South Africa amongst our youth uh, how, how, how are we going to get that fixed? How, how can the Constitutional Court do that? Uh, that's a political process. Uh, I, I, I haven't got the answers, but that, is the, that for me is a very, very serious underlying problem, is mass unemployment of the youth. How are you going to fix that? And it seems to me that Putting too much on the court is, is a bit unfair. Uh, and that's why I, I specifically chose to sing the song of the, of the uh, civic organizations because we have a history in this country of forging rights on the ground. Uh, it's the history of the, of, of, the, of, the, of the liberation struggle. It's the history of the United Democratic Front, all those sort of things. The, at the end of my uh, uh, career, I, somebody else here told me once that the rights aren't uh, created in abstract terms, they're created in the community and enforcing those rights. So uh, I haven't got the answer for you, but uh, I don't think the Constitutional Court it has an important role to play, but and it can play an important role in defining how we, we view property and the like. But I want to ask you a question, you don't have to answer it now. Is property, in the sense of land, going to solve our unemployment problem? Or is property, in the sense of access to the economy in other ways, not the, the way in which there's a better chance of doing it? I'm going to uh, ask a, loud, a last round of questions. I know there are many questions, but as I say, uh, time is not uh, uh, time.
that is our enemy at this stage. It's been a long day. So, um, I'm going to give another round, please. Uh, thank you for that, and thank you for the bravery of um, the organization that persists against all the odds. Um, Tibahale was very frustrating for me because I was in the Concord and I had to recuse myself um, because I had sat in the, in the Supreme Court of Appeal. But the question that bothers me about that case is the framing of the computation of damages. So here's uh, this community of people who are told they have houses. It belonged to them, they just didn't get into those houses. So there was a right already established. So when it comes to the stage of comp compensation, why could they not have replacement value at that point so that they could then buy well, firstly, they should, they should never have moved, but now they need a house that, or the kind of means to get them a house of similar value. So, I know that you had numbers in your papers from which you could make some kind of computation. Significant. If I recall, it was like 350,000 to half a million uh, rand would have, could have been allocated to each claimant. But that was not pursued, and so my question to you, did you feel a ceiling imposed by the state because that was not, I mean, they, they, they did raise the whole affordability debate, but it, they did not deny in any way the wrongdoing. In fact, it, the, frust, the pleadings were so fl frustrating because it was written in the passive voice. You couldn't see the actors who did all the wrong things. And nobody asked the question who were the wrongdoers, not even of Minister Sisulu of housing at the time. It's all such. So, um, what was the limitations you assumed or thought? And maybe the other colleagues can say something about what are the limitations in a situation like that, where the right is established. And it's just a whole host of things that prevented the communities from getting their houses. But, uh, and I'll almost say, going to say, congrats, Majid, you know, Brother <laughs> <laughs> Majid. Some economic decisions or budgeting decisions are so irrational. You don't need to delve into those figures. And I think if this mentality that we've got to wait through mountains of figures, which really boggles our mind, and we've got mountains of court records following us, uh, we need to sort of dis dissociate our thinking from that kind of uh, um, preparation for cases. But if you take the whole electricity drama that we're having, when a community chooses to provide electricity free of charge and solar panels to an area uh, that they service so that the economy can go on, and then the government goes and sues them and tells them, stop it. Now, where's the rationality in that? Um, and um, I noticed that the courts have not, have stopped giving, um, issuing structural interdicts. I appreciate that the Constitutional Court has a workload that doesn't, probably doesn't allow it to do that. Um, uh, but perhaps some encouragement to the lower courts to pick that up and monitor uh, the non-performance of state institutions before the court itself becomes one of those institutions that's not performing. And we've already got some evidence of that. And lastly, to the activists here, Paolo Freire will get you to an understanding of how activists should intervene in communities and be in areas that uh, uh, Judge Schoenemann is talking about and to, to interact in a way that is deferential and supportive of those communities. I don't want to, I didn't want to interrupt uh, a fellow comrade's cosmic judge. Uh, <laughs> so I, I gave you something to do. Can I keep the questions a bit short, please? Uh, thanks. Time is against us.
Testy. <laughs> All right, um, I know we were told to keep it a bit short, um, and I'm terribly sorry, but I'm trying to do my best because this is my thought process throughout. So, by way of introduction, my name is Wiggy Etzi, I'm a third year LB student, um, and here goes nothing. So, from the beginning, when I heard the presentations and where they were coming from, I thought of where does this conversation start? It starts in uh, or after two things have existed. First is after we've already legitimized the value of social economic, economic rights. That's to say, at a point we realize that these things are so important to society, we ought not to divorce ourselves from them. On a second instance, this conversation exists after we've already realized that the state has already failed in its capacity to sort of achieve certain things. These, this is um, actualizing social economic, economic rights to people that rightly deserve them. But then there's a couple of clashes, and this is where like a large part of the conversation comes, right? So these clashes come in fourfold. In the first instance, the first clash is, can we really appreciate the nuance that is needed for us to really talk about institutional economic rights? That's to say, at a point where Ms. Zondo talks about um, the realities of a woman that is poor, that, that has access to health, or sorry, that, that this comes from um, Justice Fronemann, but the realities of a poor woman who exists in those specific dire situations are we able to appreciate the nuances in that situation in order for us to actually realize the, the capacity or the capacity that we hold to act? On a second level, um, are, we, are, we, are we overwhelming our courts? And this is a concern that comes from, of course, Justice Majid, in our, our attempt at social economic rights and the fulfillment of those rights, are we then in turn overwhelming the courts that, that stand? But on, third, on the third level, the gap between the state and, and civil society, and this is where the conversations about the budget come in. Um, does the state have the capacity to do so? Also realizing that the state derives its duty, part of its duty actually, from civil society, but also the civil society needs a state in order, in order for them to survive. And on the last level, a misplacement of context. This is in twofold. The first is how a large part of this conversation misses a lot of historical things, even though we mentioned, yes, we come from an apartheid, a colonial, a colonial past, but the appreciation of those things when making these decisions to enact or uh, uh, actualize socioeconomic rights is particularly lost. And on a second level, the value of the Constitution. We think then that that's sort of common, right? At a point where a section two says that the Constitution is supreme, so on and so forth. We think then the decision making with regards to the Constitution or things that are provided within the Constitution becomes priority. But these things are not necessarily things that exist or things that uh, become fruitful um, in, in, in litigations. My solution then comes in this way. One would assume at a point where you take an oath into office as, for instance, a Chief Justice, you take an oath to civil society to do two things. One, to act, and that is to interpret the Constitution in a way that, uh, that progresses that part of the society, but also to hear them out. So I find it a bit funny when a constitutional court judge or justice pardon comes and says, well, we can't specifically hear that matter for one, two, three reasons, or challenging the, the, the constitutional concern. Is it really a constitutional concern? Is this, you get what I mean? All of these conversations ought not to happen. So one would assume at a point where you take that oath, you, you automatically take that oath also to civil society. And in ending, I think then it becomes particularly clear, especially from a Mark Fisher who writes about capitalist realism, where he says, the majority of the world sees capitalism as the only alternative that we have. That is to say, we do not exist, or the world cannot exist without a capitalism. I do not want us to exist in a legal framework that does not see an alternative to, for instance, socioeconomic rights, that does not see an alternative to the realization of the reframing of property rights and so on and so forth. And that is my posit that that both ought to be realized. Thank you very much. Okay. Well, I'll be really uh, sure. uh, due, to, due to the length of the first two questions, we only have time for four more questions. All right, all right. So, yeah, mine is very short. Um, I think the Constitution is an incomplete document because it speaks about political freedoms, it speaks about social economic freedoms, and um, a lot has been done to protect such freedoms, but the Constitution is absolutely silent when it comes to economic freedoms. And the proof of that is that South Africa is still demographically the same. I mean, if you look at our economics, or our economy, it's still the same. There has been no transformation. The Constitution calls itself a transformative document. And yes, politically, the, the dynamics have changed, power is in, is in different hands, and socioeconomically, there are some changes. We are moving towards the right direction, but economically, we, we have stagnated. 
Nothing has absolutely happened from 1994 that is fundamental, that is transformative. So in my opinion, this our constitution is, is incomplete, something is missing. How can it be that a country such as South Africa, which is founded on mineral rights, that our constitution says absolutely nothing about those rights? I think the constitution is, is incomplete in my opinion. Thank you. Uh, last question, please, everybody. Can I As the last one, sorry. Can always engage the speakers uh, in the way after. Thank you. Uh, I'm Dan second year. I, I just have two questions for you, Justice. In your conclusion, you made two propositions. You said we can only help ourselves, and then also said that uh, we only have political solutions, which would be go to democracy. So the, the first question is when you say we can only help ourselves, and litigants are always going to court only for the court to adopt reasonableness uh, standard. How are we helping ourselves then? Should we resort to lawlessness? Should we, <laughs> should we uh, disregard these laws when we are helping ourselves? Or should we continue to go to court only for the court to make fun of us every time we go there? And then uh, on the issue of political solutions, you said that uh, there's no political party currently which you think is capable of addressing our issues. Uh, there's, uh, there's this, this uh, act which has been adopted, where, which has been enacted, where independent candidates come into play now. Do you just think that independent candidates are the solution, or which solution do you think we need, a uh, political solution we need in democracy? Thank you. I, I just want to say the question that, uh, that Daya has asked, I won't answer because I think that electricity case is going to come to our board. So, Zabo, will you go first? Sure. So, I think then, uh, Justice Pillay, that when we went to the court court, the High Court had already confirmed that the houses vested in our clients on the 1st of July 2019. Um, so, and at the time, in our negotiations with the Muspans all along, the Muspans' position was, they will deliver the houses. It's just a matter of when. And we were saying, for us in our framing of the damages, we were saying, we want a, fra a framing of the damages that will put pressure on them to deliver those houses. And also to give effect to the court order from the time that the house is vested in the, in the residence to the time the house is at the moment. Uh, Justice Majid refused, refused that, that computation. Um, but I was saying, at the very least, give 10,000 and then give a structural interdict to say, come back in a year's time and come tell us what has happened. For me, the most heartbreaking thing about Tubakhan and Justice Majid was the fact that there was no relief at all. It wasn't even about the fact that we didn't get the question of damages. It was the fact that we walked out of court empty-handed especially after an, a, 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 an acceptance across the board that the behavior of the municipality amounted to egregious violation of the rights of these residents, but they still left um, empty-handed. And I think for, for me that that question of when the question of court may be the issue of the role, the heaviness of their role, but I, would, I believe that there are certain cases Right? That, as the court, you would say, this is important for, this, this is so important for us that we're going to see it through. So I feel like a subtle entity would have been one of the possible um, remedies to come out of Tubakhani, even if there were no constitutional damages. Um, in, for instance, even now, uh, we don't have, we're sent back to go and pursue contempt. We pursued contempt, I think within two weeks of the judgment we would we brought an application in the High Court. Within nine months, we were before the High Court arguing for contempt or question damages. And now, a year later, we have no judgment. Um, and it's, and in fact, the, the, the residents' complaint is, we're even in a worse position now because we're stuck. It's much better to be dismissed, because if you are dismissed, you appeal. Um, and then if you, if you lose, then you walk away. But that order um, that was issued by the Gauteng High Court to say the house is vested in you on the 1st of July 2019, 
four years later means absolutely nothing. And that's the part that is heartbreaking in Tupacari. Because you would assume that at least it must mean something. Especially because not every poor resident will be able to go and pursue a sale and run five years, six years, seven years of litigation. And therefore the question is then what about that ordinary person on the street? Probably means very little. Is there someone looking? Okay, two questions you asked me. Um, I don't think I said uh, none of the political parties can answer. Uh, I just said that as far as I can see, none have the kind of program, and I, I, I compared the situation to Botswana or the long term plan that in 2030. I, 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 maybe I haven't read the newspapers properly, haven't read the manifestos properly, but it seems to me that that kind of clarity of thinking for the future is, is not always present in our politics and that it's always a fight between this and that and so on. That's all I said. I wasn't advocating any party political solution. When I said it, it's, it's ourselves, certainly I didn't mean that going to the streets and now. It's using your rights, it's thinking of what is necessary. And, and the example that I, that I gave is that, that, that of the villages in, in the Transkai. Who would have thought of that kind of solution? I didn't know, didn't know of it. But it's that kind of innovative solution that ordinary people decide and can do. And that's, that is how things come up from the bottom and not imposed from the top. It will be very nice if the government and the Hong Kong and everybody does it from the top as well. But the most important and the most long-lasting thing that can happen, as far as I understand it, is that it must come up from the bottom, from the people themselves. They must say, well, this is what is our problem in, the, in regard to the health system. This is our problem in regard to education. This is our problem in regard to housing. And then, Work up from there. It's going to be a frustrating process, but that's how it will happen. That's all answer. Can I just say about the, uh, the student there, I just didn't get your name, who said that the Constitution is an incomplete document? Well, that is what we have. And uh, again, that is a, something that's beyond the purview of the court's powers. Um, People say that uh, it was a sellout because uh, nothing was said about the economy. Well, you know, the Constitution is there and the court works within the parameters of the Constitution. And to me, that means that there must be a rethink politically. Uh, also the court. There's just so much that the court can do. And uh, the court is often criticized, uh, particularly by politicians in the ruling party, that we are turning into the country into geodocracy. Uh, because uh, we are going too far, that we want to govern the country, particularly the Constitution. Uh, uh, and then, of course, we have from the other side that we're moving too slowly. So, one want to be, one could be cynical and say, well, we got it right then because if both sides criticize you, you said you are on the right track. But in all seriousness, I think for as far as social economic rights is concerned, the right case comes along, and in my heart, I believe that Bukhari was the right case. I think we we should uh, the court could move forward with the right facts and the right uh, circumstances. I think it's fertile ground for for the courts for jurisprudence to 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 progress. Uh, excuse the pun to progress into the area of asking what is progressive realization, uh, so that the court can start interrogating what your policies are. Um, because the policies are in place, they are implemented. And the question of reasonableness is sadly even though it's advocated. That is the, the journey that I think the court must travel if, uh, if, uh, if it is to move forward in the right case. I don't know if uh, you want to add anything further on the uh, questions. I think they are more or less answered. Uh, uh, the frustration, and uh, I was fortunate last year to go to Dublin for an international constitutional conference, and there were a number of prominent academics from uh, all Commonwealth presidents and former Commonwealth countries, also many chief justices. It was held in Dublin because last year the Irish Constitution turned 100. 
So the Chief Justice of Ireland was there, the Chief Justice of Northern Ireland was there, there was a Lord Justice from the UK Supreme Court, the New Zealand Chief Justice, and all of them were complimentary about the Constitution and the Court, but all of them were also concerned about the fact that the country seemed to be unhappy. And all of them seemed to have the idea that the, that the Constitutional Court should do more. And there was this question about the Constitutional Abolitionist Movement, which is gaining traction. And all I could say there, in all fairness, was that the Constitution is not a panacea, any Constitution, for the ills, societal ills of a country. It is a document which must be put into operation. It must be implemented. And judges are not the ones to implement it. Judges can give the most liberal, the most progressive interpretation, but they can do no more. And, uh, and that is the sad reality. And quite frankly, I'm not complaining. I think we get well paid for what we do, relatively speaking. But I think the court is being overwhelmed. And the problem is the general jurisdiction. As I've said to some colleagues uh, informally, the court was never designed as a general jurisdiction court. It was designed as a constitutional court. And so without this expanded jurisdiction, but you have the same complement of judges, same orders of operandi, all 11 must read everything and decide it. It's unworkable. I think that is a note that, on which I should finish, and I just want to, uh, I know that Vladis is going to do the, work, uh, the vote of thanks, but I'd like to thank uh, my colleagues here for, for giving, bringing us down to the ground level. And that is what David Burgess did. He used two hypotheticals, but they speak from cases that they've done themselves, and Johan speaks from his uh, experience with, uh, with those organizations. And at the end, I think this is a, a suitable uh, point to end the journey where we've started last year about socioeconomic rights adjudication. The last word obviously hasn't been spoken. But for me personally, as a sitting judge of that court, I think it's been wonderfully enriching. And it has broadened my, my views of, of what people experience on the ground. And as a court, we should be sensitive to that. And when, when you spoke first, man, I was, I, was, I was captured by the fact that, excuse the use of the word capture, but I was captured <laughs> by the fact that, what does it mean to that lady who has to go for an operation and the, the theatre has been closed? That is the reality of our situation. I'd like to thank my colleagues for making time to come. One is happily retired, the other one is extremely busy. <laughs> and also you, especially those uh, the students who are here, you are the future of the country, and uh, it's important that you engage in these debates. We need the, to hear the voice of young people, because uh, our time is up. And so you are the ones who have to take these things forward, the litigation and the education. But also our, our, our colleagues from this morning who stayed all through a long session, uh, the academics. I said informally to some of them that I think it's important that judges interact with academics, no matter how much they criticize us for getting things wrong. Because it's an enriching experience to engage with you on this level. And I, I encourage my colleagues in the court, we must continue doing this. And so with that word, I just want to close off and ask writers to come and do the vote of thanks. Um, these things are dangerous, they are okay, but I need to declare, you know, you, you, you must stop doing this. <laughs> Thank you, thank you so much, um, uh, Justice Majid, for honoring our invitation, for anchoring this series of conversations to ignite that debate on uh, the link between constitutionalism and social economic rights. Uh, and on behalf of the University of the Western Cape, the Law Faculty, and the Dola Oma Institute, this is a token of our appreciation. Um, and uh, as much as you want to be clear, but this is really thank you, thank you from the bottom of our hearts. In the interest of transparency, I declare. <laughs> I want to recognize
recognize the organizers of this uh, seminar that is a series uh, and it's been a team within the Faculty of Law and the Donna Oman Institute led by Cheryl from the Dean's Faculty. Thank you so much. Um, Dean's office, sorry, NK from the Dollar Oma Institute. To the participants, I want to say thank you for your time, for sharing your insights, especially the questions that enriched this conversation. Um, and I want to ask the panelists at the end to please remain for a photo session uh, with the team. And we are pressed for time, but uh, please welcome for something to buy before you leave. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you.